Yeah, cool. So hopefully this all works out. I'm trying to use a different device to do the uh, actual audio this time so that hopefully when I'm speaking, my, both like my screen appears, but also the little window with my face appears. Um, yeah, whatever. It doesn't really matter. But yeah, hopefully that'll uh, make it a little bit more pleasant for everybody. Um, okay, so today we're going to be starting chapter 19. Before we jump into that, just real quick, let me uh, point out with regard to lab stuff. Um, so hopefully everybody got Experiment 39 lab notebook submitted, right? Again, all I'm looking for is your notebook exactly like you would have prepared it. If we were in the lab, you're gonna watch the video. That's gonna substitute for the fact that we can't actually be in there doing the experiment. Um, in each one of these, I'm gonna to try to, like similar to what you saw, throw a little bit of a problem at you where maybe you have to write a portion of the procedure out just to get ourselves in the mind space of like us actually being in the lab. Honestly, just kind of the best I feel like I can do to, to simulate that experience. Um, 39 and 41 are gonna be rolled into a formal lab report. Uh, I kind of wanna get that out of the way. So what I've decided to do, usually you guys have a full two weeks to work on that formal lab report. What I decided to do instead is I'm gonna nix the experiment that we're supposed to have this week. So the goal of this week is for you guys to focus on that formal lab report instead of having another experiment on top of that. But that formal is going to be due a week from today at 11 p.m. Okay, so you'll have a little bit less time to work on it, but we're not gonna be doing another experiment concurrently. And then formal lab reports will be out of the way. Honestly, if I thought you guys were used the full two weeks, I would, I would give it to you, but I feel like people put it off until the end point anyway. And so let's just, let's just get it over with here. Um, I will be posting this afternoon the guidelines for that. I mean, it's going to be the same in terms of structural format. The big focus here is going to be on these reaction mechanisms. Okay, that's like the main focus I want of your lab report. We have three different reactions that we did. They are all the exact same aldol addition followed by condensation. I want to know, I want to know that you know those reaction mechanisms in and out. All right, so nice, pretty pictures demonstrating those reaction mechanisms is gonna be an important part of this lab report, okay? Any questions on that before we uh, dive into more about it? Oh, it's, it's all in one report, right? It's not two separate formal reports. It's no, it's one... not two separate reports, right? Okay. I mean, there, we, we started off with three different sets of reactants, but they were all the same reactions. Right, and so that's that. I want to make sure that you guys know those reaction mechanisms, why we get the products we get at the end of the day. Uh, but no, you're not writing multiple reports. It's it's just one report, and you're just acting like you did the same experiment with three different reactions, three different reactants rather. Okay. So, cool. how, how do we attack this in the in the way of like method? Um, do we just write two procedures? Well, I mean, like I, don't, I think you want to try to find the common thread throughout them, right? Like, I mean, you, you don't want to, your methods aren't supposed to read necessarily like procedures, but you're doing pretty much the same thing in each of these two reactions. Yes, so the one you have to wait longer for the reaction to occur. I mean, the one, I don't know if you guys saw, but it happened within like 15 seconds of me stirring. The other one, you sat there and reflux for an hour. So yeah, those uh -huh. are two different ways in which we're gonna have to like differentiate what happened with this set of reactants for this one. But in both of them, you're starting out with an aldehyde or ketone and you're adding base, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot that's common about them. And I think focusing on what's common about them rather than writing two nearly identical set of procedures is a smarter way to go. Okay. One's gonna read much better. The other one's gonna seem like you just regurgitated two, two sets of procedures. So I might, and no, and, I might. And, and, sorry, real quick, just to be, uh, uh, I will be semi kind to you guys in the fact that you guys didn't actually do this experiment. So that makes it much harder to uh, write a methods for an experiment that you never actually performed. But of course, that's part of the challenge of what you're doing, reading through the procedures and watching the videos. Sorry, what were you gonna say? Uh, um, um, ooh, ooh, uh, I'm not quite, I don't quite remember. Oh, all right. Uh, and I mean, uh, if you, uh, 
between now and then, if you have any questions, you always can hit me up. Well, we can, I'm happy oh. to be with you guys like on a Zoom chat or something like that outside of class to discuss your report as well, right? You guys should feel free to hit me up and arrange any sort of office hours. Again, for the most part, I'm just sitting here twiddling my thumbs as well, right? So it's not like I don't have all the time in the world to uh, be having meetings and stuff. Yeah, you've been really responsive on emails, which is super cool. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I definitely try my best just to make make myself very available. And yeah, again, truth be told, what what else am I doing? If I'm not walking the dog, I'm here. So <laughs> that's about it. Um, so yeah, so whatever, Carlo. If you do if if you do think of a question or have a more specific question or whatever, you know, just let me know. Yeah, it's um. So on your experiment thirty nine video, yeah. you had a A and B. Is that referring to just specifically experiment 39 and then 41 is a separate video with a separate experiment, but they're the same reaction? Um, same reaction that mechanism, yeah. And in 39, basically, I started out with two different sets of reactants. Right. And that followed basically the experimental protocol. And then the only thing that I could think to do to like get you guys a little bit more engaged was to be like, oh, ha ha, I don't know which one's which anymore, you guys figure it out. <laughs> that was just to add a little bit of an element of trying to get you guys to critically think because you couldn't right. for yourselves. Right. Yeah, when I saw that, I was like, you fucker, I know you didn't do that. <laughs> no. <laughs> to be honest, I did forget to hit record because I was in the middle of a meeting with the rest of the staff. And so I forgot uh -huh. to record that portion. So I was like, all right, well, I guess I can throw this little thing in there and make it whatever. Um, but yeah, no, I, I didn't actually mix them up. Um, but yeah, so there's three different compounds. You got A and B from experiment 39 and then another one from experiment 41. Okay. And, and when it comes to the results, we'll just put both results as well. Yeah. You'll put the results from both of the experiments as well, which I gave you. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. All right, so um, yeah, and again, if you guys have any more questions on that, let me know. I'll post those guidelines. They're going to be very similar, just like we've you've seen the other formal, the basically telling you what's in an intro, what's in a method, blah blah blah, and then I'll tailor them slightly more specifically to this particular set of uh, experiments. Um, yeah. Cool. So for experiment thirty nine, um, did you just do the Hirsch funnel, or did you do the crisp, the crystallization purification? So that's that. what I, I, I said I mixed up my compounds during the crystallization. So I did do the crystallization. The yield that, you've, that you get in that spreadsheet is post-crystallization. I always did the, um, you don't have a crude yield, you just have a pure yield for each of these experiments. Cool? Cool. All right, so um, chapter 19. So good news, chapter 19 is really not too bad. Um, I think we'll be able to do the whole thing this week, which is awesome, because then we can set aside Tuesday to do nothing but review for 18 and 19 before we get to the exam. Um, chapter 19, more about a means is the name of this chapter. Uh, specifically, though, I think the new stuff here, yes, we are going to spend a bit of time reviewing a means. But of course, like, We've seen the means in just about every chapter that we've gone over. They've played some sort of like, oh, and here's what a means do role. The big thing is going to be these heterocyclic compounds. So compounds, so for example, something that might look like this. All right, these are, this, these are really the meat of the new part of what this chapter is going to be is these chemistry of these type of compounds here. Okay, but we are- That's not a, that's not a lactam, is it? No, it is not. So that would have been, you would need, first of all, it can't be, couldn't have these guys here and you would have to have. Oh, right. The last time I was a uh, carbonyl. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so anyway, that's, that's going to be the big new part. And, and just spoiler alert, they behave a lot like benzene. All right. So that's why we're lumping these two chapters together here. Um, but yeah, let's, let's just, first we're going to talk about amines, do some review here. This chapter, in part, or this, this lecture in particular, there's going to be a lot of pencil paperwork on your part. So get ready to like uh, do some practice problems again. They're going to be digging back in our brains. So this is uh first two things here is see what, tell me if you can't, uh, or see if you can't tell me what happens when we mix an amine with these two compounds here. Both hydrobromic acid or an alkyl bromide. All right, I'm looking for 
giving me the products as well. If, if you can give me the electron pushing arrows, our curvy arrow reaction mechanisms, that would be great. Take this opportunity to take attendance real quick. Is it an alkyl halide and the ammonia? An alkyl halide and ammonia. Alkyl halide, is that what you meant? This is an alkyl halide right here. Yeah, the R, R, B, R. Um, all right, well, so first of all, let's just see. So what's this compound here? Uh, let me get my little. Hydrobromic what? Acid. Yeah, right. HBr is an acid. We got this donatable proton. So again, this is just sort of review. First thing to remember, amines, they can play the role of a base. They're not particularly banging bases, but they are pretty good bases, right? So in this case here, if we're going to do our curvy arrow mechanism, we have the nitrogen acting as a base or, you know, another, which is just a fancy way of saying a nucleophile when hydrogen is the electrophile. That would break that there. And so we would get this protonated amine or what we call an ammonium. All right, so protonated amines are ammoniums of sorts. Sometimes they have a little bit more special names, but they all end in this eum. That's how you know you're talking about having this nitrogen with the plus charge on it. All right, and then similar when we have an amine and an alkyl halide. Again, nitrogen can act as a nucleophile. So this is amines acting as a nucleophile with an alkyl halide. And this will create, uh, in this case, a secondary ammonium, which you can then, of course, just treat with some sort of a base and get a secondary amine. All right, but that is what we've seen from nitro, you know, amines in particular, but really nitrogens, right? We think about them very similar to oxygen in that they have this donatable pair of electrons. They can play the role of a nucleophile because they are pretty electronegative. They're not quite as electronegative as oxygen. So whenever we're comparing the two, we got to keep those in mind. But nonetheless, uh, yeah, they are playing the role of nucleophiles most of the time. They are electron rich and have that donatable pair. Um, physical properties, let's just real quick think about what this means real quick. This is like boiling point, melting point business. So if you're going to rank, everybody take a second and rank these three compounds here. Uh, I guess we just do one less carbon from highest to, oh no, we'll make them the same size. Highest to lowest boiling point. Or I guess lowest to highest makes more sense. Which one is the lowest boiling point? The alcohol. No, lowest the boiling point. Alkane. The alkane, yeah. Alkane is the lowest followed by? The amine and then the alcohol is actually the highest boiling point. Why is the alcohol the highest boiling point? Remember boiling point is synonymous with- in Electronegativity. It's a, yeah, electronegativity, but it's a little bit more complicated than that, right? 
Boiling point Hydrogen. is synonymous with this, yeah, boom, there it is. Synonymous with this concept of intra or intermolecular interactions. So how strongly can one alkane molecule interact with another alkane molecule? Not very strongly because they don't have any sort of polar groups. So yes, absolutely, Carlo. The big thing here are these hydrogen bonding sort of things that you can have between neighboring alcohol molecules or between neighboring amine molecules. So amines can hydrogen bond as well. They just don't do so quite as strongly as alcohols because of the fact that nitrogen is less electronegative than oxygen, right? But again, just something to keep in mind. Amines, again, sort of in that way, behaving similar to alcohols, they can hydrogen bond and that gives them relatively high boiling points. Okay, uh, and then selects, the last thing we're gonna go over is just a review of naming. So make sure that you guys take a second to name these three compounds here. And remember, it gets a little bit more trickier for secondary amines and then a little bit even more trickier for tertiary amines. So take a second and see if you can't give me the name of these three compounds. All right, so in the simplest case, we have one, two, three, four, five carbons. So this is a pentanamine, right? Remember, we got to include that AN to indicate there's no double bonds. Um, so if we wanted to do one, or no, let's do pent. Two N one. I mean, that would be an example of an enamine where you have that double bond as well. So this would look something like one, two, one, two, three, four. All right, make sure you can include that an in there. Secondary amines, how do we, what do we do for this one? Uh, I got an ethyl one butanamine. Yeah, awesome. Right, so here you have to make sure that you include both sides of this compound here, right? All, every single time we have this nomenclature, the name of the game is including all parts of the molecule. So this part over here, the larger part becomes the parent chain. So that's our one, two, three, four carbon that makes it a butanamine. But we also have to account for these one, two carbons over here. So this is how we have this N-ethyl. All right, similar how we would denote alkyl groups. Um, usually we would use a number, but instead this time we're gonna be using the letter N. All right, and then lastly for our tertiary amine, what do we have? N-methyl uh, propionamine. Yeah, awesome. And why did you put the ethyl before the methyl? Um, alphabetical order. Alphabetical order, awesome. So yep, so we have an N-ethyl, N-methyl, one propanamine. Cool. So hopefully that's review um, in terms of how we're naming our amines. We also, now I gotta throw a little bit of a curveball here, our cyclic amines. 
We actually kind of sort of know how to do this. Uh, Eric brought it up before. We knew how to do this when there was a OXO group on that, right? Those were our two OXO what? Lactan? No. Yeah, well, so that was yeah, the class, lactan. but we used a special prefix for these. Azocyclo. Nice. Absolutely. So these were azocyclo. Now instead of, now we don't have that OXO group, so we just leave off the two OXO portion, and these are just all azocyclo compounds. Um, again, like we saw before, notice that this is a azocyclopropane, even though we only have one, two carbons, right? So again, like we saw before, you're really designating the number of members of the ring, not just counting carbons. All right, and then, I mean, going down the line here, this is obviously, we're just increasing in size azocyclopentane, azocyclohexane. These guys in particular, you know, I'm not gonna throw no um, common name curveballs at you on the exam, but I do think it's just important to note this sort of language things. Amine compounds, again, in the grand scheme of chemistry are, are, are relatively old. Um, they are very big key players in biochemistry. So they all have some fancy names that stick around. In, in particular, these three and four member rings, um, the pyrrolidine and the piperidine are something that you might see very commonly. I don't, honestly, they, these smaller ones apparently have common names, never heard them in my life. But these ones you might come across in your reading pretty commonly. Those really small ones, would they even, would they even be favored just because the, uh, the angles are so weird? I mean, I guarantee you they are incredibly reactive, like incredibly unstable, uh, but that doesn't mean that they don't exist, right? I mean, there's a difference between can't exist because it's just so unstable and will react at, you know, negative 78 degrees Celsius or something like that because of ring strain. So yeah, so I, I mean, I think bottom line, you can form these, but yes, they will absolutely be more reactive than their five and six membered ring counterparts. All right, and then take a second to tell me what would happen in naming these two guys here. Oh, well, that was pretty bad, but let's do this one and this one. See if you guys can't give me the name of those two. Uh, for the first one, I got two methyl azocyclohexane. Yeah. Right. So now the important thing to remember here is that when you start numbering, you're going to start with that nitrogen, right? That's going to get to be number one. So this would be one, two, three, four, five, six. So it's a six membered ring. So it's going to be an azocyclohexane with a methyl group at position two. Now, what do you do when you have an alkyl group on the nitrogen instead of another position on the ring? And ethyl. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I don't know. I feel like it might be tempting to write one ethyl since the nitrogen is position one. But when you have a substituent on the nitrogen, you're going to designate with that with the N-ethyl azocyclo, uh, azocyclopentane. Okay. Um, again, so this chapter is going to be, you know, amines are going to feature a pretty prominent role, but we're also going to be talking about just heterocyclic compounds in general. The other two elements that you're going to see is going to be oxygen and sulfur. Okay, so just in terms of um, naming these guys, again, we sort of saw our two oxo, oxocyclo in this case, propane. Okay, we saw that when we were looking at um, cyclic esters. Here again, it's the same sort of nomenclature, but you drop the two oxo prefix. And then when we get to these guys, so what do we call our sulfur containing rings? These are styacyclo. Okay, 
T-H-I-A, which is kind of uh, weird because usually we're used to uh, talking about sulfur with the prefix thio. This is thia, obviously very si uh, similar, but you know, something you want to keep, make sure to keep not mixed up in your brain. And again, just like before the number, the, uh, the prefix that you use in this case, prop, and in this case, but, indicates the number of members in the ring total. Um, yeah, so oxycyclopentane. We'll, we'll go over some common names. Uh, furan is another one um, that you will see a lot, but we'll, we'll see some ex more specific examples of that. All right, so nomenclature on our nitrogen-containing compounds, we actually sort of already know a good bit about. Okay, now let's talk about acid-base properties of these guys. So, of course, we talked about the fact that amines can play the role of bases, right? That means that the ammoniums, the conjugate acids, can play the role of acids. And remember that we can actually rank how good something is as a base by looking at the pKa of a conjugate acid. So if you have a good base versus a bad base, if you have a good base, what does that mean about the pKa? The pKa is really high. So a good base will have a high pKa of its conjugate acid, a bad base, the pKa is low, right? A bad base, that means that it's uh, conjugate acid is a really good acid, right? Low pKa's mean good acids. So just keep this in mind as we're gonna go through and look at some of these here, okay? So the standard, the one that you kinda wanna think of in your mind in reference to is the standard old ammonium ion or a primary amine that's been protonated. This has a pKa of around 10, okay? Something to keep in mind because, you know, um, especially when, we, when we're in organic chemistry now, right? We were talking about the uh, pKa of those alpha hydrogens of ketones. Does anybody remember what those were around? Right, we spent a whole chapter on these acidic alpha hydrogens. Are those higher or lower than a pKa of 10? Higher. Yeah, higher, right? So, I mean, when we were talking about these acidic alpha hydrogens, we were talking about pKa's on the order of 17 to 20. All right, so just keep that in mind when we're talking about the pKa of this ammonium ion. It's, you know, 10.8 it, is, you know, in, t in terms of if you add it to water, it won't make it more acidic, but it's relatively easy to pull off with something like a hydroxide or something like that. All right, so it's not, it's not hard to deprotonate an amine. Or, I'm sorry, to deprotonate an ammonium. Um, but when we go for an amine, the pKa of that, and now we're talking about removing this hydrogen in order to make something like CH3NH minus, that has a higher or lower pKa than 10.8? Uh, higher. Yeah, way higher, right? Way, way higher to the point of being very, very, very difficult to remove. Right, so when you have a protonated ammonium ion, that proton's not very hard to remove. When you're talking about an amine itself, it is not acidic. You would not consider it to be an acid in almost any case. All right, and then we have this anilinium ion, right? So remember that this guy's special name is aniline. So when it's protonated, it's now an anilinium, still that I-U-M ending ion. Is that going to have a pKa higher or lower than 10.8? Does anybody remember? Or want to venture a guess? Lower? No. Yeah, uh, and why would that be? Uh, well, it wants to get rid of the hydrogen so it can be stable. It wants to get rid of the hydrogen so it can be stable. And why is the, why would it be more stable? Well, let's just like do it real quick. Why is there this resonance? Stable? Yeah, absolutely. Right. So now this guy is even more stable than your standard old amine because this pair of electrons here can participate in that benzene's resonance network. 
All right, so these guys are even more uh, stable than a, a, just a regular old amine, and that makes the anilinium ion even more of a strong acid, a stronger acid, which of course, as we can go back to this at the top, right, means that aniline, aniline is a worse base than a regular amine. All right, and then down here, looking at all these different heterocyclic compounds, the one thing I just want to say is they're all pretty much the same as a regular old amine. There are marginal effects here or there when you have, um, you know, I don't even know what the difference would be between the five and six membered ring, why those are slightly different. Probably something to do with angle strain of forcing that nitrogen uh, to be that sp3 hybridized. I don't really know. Bottom line is they all sit around that same pKa as an amine. And then just to compare this, so like we said, the alpha hydrogen on a carbonyl, those pKa's are 20 for a ketone, more like 17 for an aldehyde, right? So still higher than when we're talking about an ammonium ion. What about for an alcohol? Does anybody remember pKa of that? So those are about the same as water. You kind of want to have that number 15 off the top of your head. All right, so we're talking about compounds that are more acidic than our alpha hydrogens or alcohols, but less acidic than carboxylic acids, which tend to have pKa's in the five region. Okay. All right, so that in terms of these, give me which one has, let's actually, lowest is kind of hard. Which one has the highest? pKa value. Everybody take a second and see if you can't tell me that. It would be A, wouldn't it? Absolutely. Why is it A? Uh, because um, its hydrogen would be toughest to remove. It's high, well, yeah, so that's, that's just pKa's mean, right? So what you really want to notice is all of these other ones are protonated. These are all ammoniums of sorts, right? This is just a standard old amine. So this is going to have the highest pKa here. Um, I'll tell you that these guys are relatively similar to one another. Um, so then in terms of B and C, which one's going to come next? B. Right, yep. So just like we saw on the previous slide, B is going to have the next highest pKa because these guys are relatively lower because they can be stabilized through resonance. Uh, truthfully, with this one, it seems like resonance should be a key factor and it actually has more to do with the fact that this nitrogen is sp2 hybridized but let's not let's not go down that rabbit hole uh, we're going to call those about the same and then this guy right here is something special this is called an indol again these things have very common names because they were discovered really early on this is actually a key part of the amino acid tryptophan which is the one that turkey has a bunch of that makes you fall asleep Fun fact. Anyways, tryptophan's major functional group is this indol group here. This actually has the lowest pKa for very similar reasons of this guy here, which is when it's deprotonated, these electrons can be part of this resonance network. But now let's rewind in our mind real quick. So I'm going to just remove this here so we can see what it looks like when it's protonated. I'll give you a million dollars if you can see why E would be that much more stable than C when it's deprotonated. Anybody? Well, it has the double bond. So it's got a double bond, but uh, similar to this. So why, if we're going to compare again, C. Is it because of secondary amine? It's not, the, it's not the Is secondary it amine. Is hydrogen? No. Anybody else? There's one very special word that we learned 
that has that's even better than resonance, right? The if you aromatization. No, not no, not <laughs> aromatic. Aromatic. <laughs> aromatic. Who said it? Sam, I nice job, dude. Absolutely, right? So there was one thing, you know, having resonance structures is good. That adds stability. But once you meet that threshold of being aromatic, that's like the super special category, right? So if we want to remind ourselves in our mind to chapter eight, and this is a really good thing to just look over, this is that 4N plus two rule, right? So which is, you have to have this 4N plus two number of electrons. Another way to say that is an odd number of pairs of electrons, all in the same sort of linear plane system. So this has now two, four, six, eight, ten. So it meets that four n plus two, right? So not only does it have these, once it's deprotonated, can its pair of electrons contribute to a resonance network, it actually makes it aromatic, right? So that's even better. All right, so now everybody take a second. These are all these one, two, three, four, five reactions are all reactions that you guys should know from various parts of this semester. So I'm gonna give you guys a good like solid five minutes here to work these out. See if you can't remember all, you know, this is now incorporating many different chapters here, but these are uh, the different reactions that we've seen from our amines. Who is Odalise? Carlo, is that you? Yeah, that's that's me. I uh, my my computer was acting up, so I took yeah, my no girlfriend. Right. I was just like, wait a minute, do we have a <laughs> random person sitting in?
All right, let's do it. So first one, we have methylamine and ethyl bromide, or sorry, methylamine and ethyl bromide. Uh, what am I gonna get out of it? What's my final product gonna be? Ethylamine. Close. Oh, okay. Oh. Ethyl, methyl, ethyl, whatever. Yeah, N-methyl, ethyl enamine, right? So first of all, what key thing to remember here is, again, nitrogen is going to be playing the role of a nucleophile, going to kick off that bromine. First, you get this, you know, it really, if you mix these two together, you would get this salt at the end of the day, this ammonium bromide salt. But again, that proton is really not that hard to remove. So any amount of, like, base that we would add would pop that off and we would get ethyl methyl or N methyl ethanamine. All right, and what happens when we take an acyl chloride and mix it with an amine? What do we get? An amide. An amide. And why do we need two equivalents of our amine? One's a base, one's a nucleophile? Yeah, so one of them acts as the base, the other one ends up accepting that proton as, uh, uh, I'm sorry, one is the nucleophile doing the original attacking of our carbonyl carbon, the other one acts as a base accepting that proton, right? So again, this is gonna be the common theme here, nitrogen plays the role of a nucleophile. Bump that up there. All right, what happens when we take a primary amine and mix it with a ketone? These two I find to be some of the less intuitive of the amine reactions. Anybody? An enamine? So, no, not, these aren't the enamines, but close. These are the oh, imines, right? So if it's a primary amine, both of those hydrogens can be removed and they're replaced with a carbon-nitrogen double bond. Right, and again, uh, I feel like it just helps to draw these a little bit different for some reason, in my head at least it is. All right, so if we're gonna, again, oops, five-membered ring. Here we had our ketone to start out with. Really, we're just gonna whoop, and replace that with the nitrogen. And the secondary ketone, or the secondary amine gives the enamine. Yeah, right? absolutely, right? So here we don't have two hydrogens to remove, we only have one. So instead, the last hydrogen that gets removed is actually from that alpha carbon, right? That's the last step in those reaction mechanisms to give us our enamine. So let me just make this prettier. Okay, um, and then of course, you know, last chapter, not last chapter, two chapters ago, we saw a bunch of fun stuff that you can do with these enamines. Um, and then lastly, what happens when you take on, this would be an alpha beta unsaturated. It favors the conjugate addition. Enone, absolutely. So this, remember the, the shtick about the alpha beta unsaturated is you have two electrophiles, the normal old carbonyl carbon, but also that beta carbon. Um, and in this case, you would get addition to that, well, you would get conjugate addition, which is addition to that beta carbon. Why is that? Uh, more reactive compounds favor direct addition. Um, more reactive. Really the only thing I remember. Yeah, you're right. More reactive specifically more reactive nucleophiles, right? So an amine is considered to be a nucleophile, but it's, it's no Grignard, right? It's not like this ridiculous nucleophile. Uh, it's considered to be a relatively weak nucleophile. So that's why you'll get the conjugate addition there. All right, so this is just a summary of all these different things that we've sort of already seen here from our amines. Cool? Okay, so now let's, let's get into the newer stuff here. Um, and these are again going to have the new stuff is mainly going to focus on, focus on these heterocyclic compounds. So let's take a look at these three here. 
These all sort of go by these common names because they, um, they're not just cyclic amines, but they have these double bonds. Uh, they have their own special name, kind of like a benzene does. Okay, so this is pyrrole. This guy is furan and thiophene. Okay, um, in our mind, we're gonna lump all these guys together. Okay, they are gonna undergo very similar types of reactions. All right, so we're gonna sort of like stick them in the same group in our minds together. We know, what do we notice about pyrrol? Not only does it have this pair of electrons here and this pair of electrons here, but also this pair of electrons on this nitrogen can participate in this ring. So this is again, this concept of aromatic coming into play, right? All five, all three of these compounds here, despite being five membered rings, they still have six electrons that can participate in one network of pi bonds. So they are still aromatic. They got that extra added stability that you get from an aromatic compound. Okay, so again, just like benzene is that special aromatic six membered ring, pyrrol, furan, and thiophene are now our aromatic heterocycles. And if we look at the sort of orbital structure of these, Again, very importantly, what we see, let me just actually color these things even better. All right, we have this pair of electrons. This will be this bond here, extending above and below. This pair of electrons that's here. And then lastly, that pair of electrons on that nitrogen is actually sitting in that p orbital, right? So it's lined up in that same ring. So it's actually participating again in that sort of aromatic network of pi bonds. When we go to oxygen, we see something very similar. It's got a pair of electrons that's participating. Okay, it's got these other two as well. All right, so here and here. But oxygen also has a second lone pair. Okay, very importantly, that lone pair isn't participating in that network of p orbitals. Then we wouldn't have those six, that 4n plus two magical number of electrons that would put us at eight. That's not aromatic, no good, right? So just keep that in mind. Those are actually sticking out away from the ring. Are they in the s orbital? They're in an sp2 orbital. What is n again? N is, uh, so when, when you mean the 4N plus 2 rule? Yeah. N can equal 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way to infinity. It's a counting number, but it gives you a sequence of, this is like shorthand for the sequence of numbers 2, 6, 10. Right, um, but I'm saying what would like be N, what would consider like 1N or 2N? So N is not something you solve for. This formula right here is shorthand for a sequence of different numbers. So you would be aromatic oh, I got with you. two, with six, with 10, 14. It's, it's a shorter okay. way of writing out an infinite list of numbers. Got it, thank you. And then uh, notice that furan and thiophene, you're gonna have the same sort of electronic geometry there. An extra pair of electrons that isn't contributing to the ring, but one pair that is. All right, um, and what we're gonna see about these, oh, well, I guess first let's talk about these, uh, what's called delocalization energy. This is like how much more stable that aromat aromaticity is given to like what you would expect by virtue of just having double bonds, right? That's sort of the magical thing about benzene that we saw is that like adding a double bond, uh, or once you get to that aromatic network, you see a huge decrease versus something say like this that has two uh, double bonds, but they're not in resonant or not aromatic. So this is just how much more stable you are. Um, benzene is actually going to be the most stable compared to your furan. And then this just has to do with how electronegative oxygen is versus nitrogen versus sulfur. Um, 
yeah, I don't, I don't know that this is something you want to spend too much time on. This is the free energy of the compound itself, not pertaining to like reactivity. Okay, this is just how much more, you know, we're going to say that it's aromatic, and that means that it's that much more stable. But how much more stable? Can we compare these two things? Aromatic for benzene is like maximum stability. Aromatic for furan is good, just not quite as great. It's kind of the, the bottom line of the delocalization energies. Okay, so, okay, that kind of makes sense. Since like benzene is like the maximum of stability, therefore you need a really good electrophile in order for it to react with it. Right. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Um, that's part of it for sure. Absolutely. Like, right, it, that first step is really slow because you got to break that aromaticity. And, and and we are we are gonna see that these compounds are more reactive than benzene, but let's let's not jump ahead. That's a tiny bit too much. So one of the things that's kind of weak, uh, kind of weird about pyrrol is first of all, it is a very weak weak base. Okay, that has to do with the fact that if we were to try to add a proton we would have to break that aromaticity. Even weirder though, is if we stick it in the presence of a really strong acid, if we force it to be protonated, it's not the nitrogen that gets protonated. It's actually the, uh, the carbon right next to it. And we'll see why this is in just a second. But notice this PKA here. Right? Does that it's mean that super pyrrole, acidic. it's ridiculously acidic? I mean, that's like hydrochloric acid level acidity right there. Right, so pyrrole is just a really crappy base. If you do put it in the presence of something like a ton of sulfuric acid, it will accept a proton, but it actually does so on the C2 carbon. And then this is actually completely unstable. If we do have this sort of protonated, so now let's say, okay, fine, we do protonate it, we get this compound here, it will actually start to react with its neighbor in such a way to create this type of compound here. And then it's just gonna keep on going and going and going. So actually what ends up happening in the presence of strong acid is you end up getting just reactions between neighbors that create this polymer type substance. So bottom line is it's completely impractical to start uh, trying to do reactions with pyrrol in the presence of really, really strong acid. Um, in terms of the pKa of pyrrol, removing that hydrogen, right? So this is now um, pKa of removing the hydrogen from pyrrol. It's about 17. So compared to an amine, which is like 40, it's relatively easy to remove, but still harder than, again, if you had like an alcohol or water um, it's on par to like an alpha hydrogen of a ketone or aldehyde. Uh, in comparison to, again, now this is just the, the cyclic version, but an amine, and that has a pKa around 36. So, you know, relative, in the grand scheme of things, it, it's possible to remove it. It's not impossible, but uh, you got to have a pretty good base in there. Pretty banging base. Okay, dang, I did not finish this slide. All right, well, whatever. Um, so first of all here, again, what you wanna do when you're thinking about these heterocyclic compounds is the fact that they behave very similar to benzene. Okay, so what we're gonna see of these different five-membered ring compounds that we just learned about, the pyrrol, the furan, the thiophene, they can all undergo these electrophilic aromatic substitution reactions. And specifically when they do, it's that C2 carbon that's going to be prone to being uh, prone to substitution. So in the case of furan, we react it with bromine. We get bromination of that C2 carbon. So again, this is just your electrophilic aromatic substitution reaction. We don't need um, a catalyst. Yeah, so we'll get to that in one second, but no. And we'll see why that is in one second. Let me wipe this out because we want to go through this step by step. Um, and then in the case of now we have 
Got two methyl pyrrol here. We're going to brominate the only available carbon would be this one here. So again, these guys do not, the three and four, carbons three and four do not get substituted. And, and you don't need a catalyst and, and we'll see why this is in a second. Um, but let's just go through the reaction mechanism because we know that real quick. Just like before, here it's, it's the benzene ring that's going to be playing the role of the uh, nucleophile, or I guess it's not the benzene ring. The pyrrol ring, it's not the nitrogen itself. So different from all of our amine reactions that we saw, nitrogen was being our nucleophile. For these heterocyclates, it's going to be the ring. All right, so here we have the ring playing the role of the nucleophile. The next step is to just get some base that's going to deprotonate. All right, that's the slow part. The fast part is getting rid of that base to restore our aromaticity. And that's how we get our substitution products here. So before we jump into why we don't need a catalyst, let's talk about why the heck it's only the C2 position and not the C3 carbon. Okay, um, what I want you guys to do here is try to give me, it's it, much like before, it's gonna be an argument about resonance contributors, but a big part of this chapter is going to be making, I don't know about a big part, but uh, one of the pieces that we're gonna to have to pull on that we learned last semester is our ability to draw resonance structures, right? In chapter eight, we spent a ton of time drawing different resonance structures. That's going to be inevitably a portion of the chapter, you know, the last chapter that we just learned with benzene, we saw it a lot, as well as this one. So everybody take a second and see if you can't give me all resonance contributors of electrophilic aromatic substitution at the two position. All right, so do this first step here and then show me all the various resonance contributors. Are there three of them? There are indeed three for the two prime uh, for the uh, yeah for the two, two position. position. Yep. All right. So again, um, and and just to like take a step back so we can sort of appreciate what's what's going on here. Um, Again, we learned in chapter eight how to draw these different resonance contributors. What we did in the last chapter, as well as what we're going to, just going to do now, is using these resonance structures to sort of support the argument as to why it adds at the two position versus the three position. Similar to what we were doing with benzene when we were arguing that it was an ortho uh, para director versus a meta director, and we use resonance structures to do that, right? So this is like we're kind of building our argument here using these resonance structures. All right, so two prime position. Again, the first thing we're gonna see is that positive charge jumps onto that nitrogen. 
that's relatively stable to have a charge on that atom there. But then we can also draw two more resonance contributors for that intermediate, right? So these are all intermediates in this reaction that you're still gonna have to remove that hydrogen in order to reform that aromatic. But again, it's all about spreading that charge out across the ring, right? So here we have three different resonance contributors. We can do the same thing for the three prime position, but we're gonna find that we're only able to draw two distinct resonance contributors. Again, you got that one that's relatively stable because you got the charge on the nitrogen. So that's not what's different between the two. But here we have two, three resonance contributors versus two. So it's just that much more stable, right? More resonance contributors, more stable. So this is what, why you're going to see in these heterocyclics that you only have, or for the five-membered heterocyclics, you only have uh, electro, uh, I'm sorry, electrophilic aromatic substitution on the C2 carbon. All right, and then lastly, the sort of now going to getting to this argument of why you need a catalyst. If we're going to talk about the relative reactivity of these with regard to electrophilic aromatic substitution and compare it with benzene, they are all more reactive than benzene in these electrophilic aromatic substitutions. Okay, importantly, if we're talking about elect, right, there are two different classes of reactions we learned last time. So I hope we, uh, in last chapter rather. So I hope we, everybody was able to split those two in their brain. Um, when we're talking about the electrophilic aromatic substitution, let's just say we're talking about benzene. What role is benzene playing? It's a nucleophile. It's a nucleophile in the electrophilic aromatic substitutions, right? And again, what's, what makes a good property of a nucleophile? Electron rich. Right, so what we saw is when we substituted this benzene with electrons donors, that made those rings even more reactive. Well, here what we have with these heterocyclic rings are essentially electron donors that are built into the ring. Right, so by putting these guys on the ring itself, it just makes the ring that much more nucleophilic. Okay, so it's just like when you had an electron donor attached to a benzene ring, we see the same thing with these heterocyclic rings. We have electron donors in the ring itself. So these rings are that much more nucleophilic. So with your halogenation, you don't need a catalyst. Um, I don't know. I feel like this is kind of annoying that they're introducing these random things because uh, I don't really go over what these two catalysts are doing for you. But bottom line is they're less... less crazy than your... Uh, Aluminum chloride, right? This is what you needed for these acylation reactions. Remember that these were the slowest of all the different reactions that you had. Well, it's fairly easy to acylate your thiophene as well as your furan. And then if you have a pyrol, you actually don't need a catalyst at all starting with either or an acyl chloride or what were these guys down here, here called? Anhyde, aldehyde or anhyde? No, you're close, yeah. So these are acid and acid hydride. And right, so both of those will react spontaneously with pyrrole, no catalyst at all needed. Um, remember that the leaving group of an acid anhydride is actually a carboxylic acid. All right, but the bottom line is just like we saw benzene undergoing these electrophilic aromatic substitution reactions, we can do the same thing with these heterocyclic rings, but they're, when we're talking about the five-membered rings, they're even better, right? They're that much more nucleophilic the rings are. And again, remember that you always have addition, substitution rather, at that C2 carbon. Okay. Um, actually, next is going to be jumping into the six-membered ring. I, I want to, we'll save that for last, 
next class because that's actually all we had left to do in this chapter. Um, but I will tell you, you want to keep the five-membered ring of pyrol in a different place in your mind than the six-membered ring pyridine. Okay, we're going to see that these behave in very different ways. Uh, most notably, pyrol is more reactive than benzene for electrophilic aromatic substitution. We're going to see the pyridine is actually less reactive, but we'll, we'll go into all that argument later. Um, and again, you really want to think of these things as behaving very similar to benzene. We're always going to be comparing relative to benzene for these types of reactions. Okay, but that's, that's actually sort of all we get. I mean, yeah. I don't know. We went even faster through that than I thought we were going to. So uh, I'll have to figure out some practice problems to build up the rest of the uh, lecture next time. But you guys have any questions on these, these reactions here? I, I got to admit, I don't love the fact that they introduced these two sets of uh, reactants. And in the book, they don't really tell why you need one for one and the other for the other. I, I'll look in to see if I don't have a better explanation of why you have two different sets of catalysts here. But importantly, when you have the pyrrol, it is the most reactive and you, there's no catalyst that's needed. That's only for pyrrol. Only for pyrrol with regard to these acylations, right? The acylations were the hardest of the electrophilic aromatic substitutions to do. So with regard to those, you don't need a catalyst. Um, when we had our halogenation, none of them need a cal catalyst. So for the aromatic five ring substitutions we just saw, there was a plus sign in the first two. What's on the other side of those? What's the other product? Oh, sorry, sorry. Just a proton in that, that chloride that pops off. Yeah, the, the big thing, uh, right, yeah, so the leaving group there is the chloride. I, I just wanted everybody, one thing to kind of keep in mind, when you have this acid anhydride, your leaving group is actually a, a carboxylic acid. That's one of the things that makes it so reactive. Cool. All right, and then uh, what else? You guys have one other thing to do for me this week. What is that? Homework. Homework. All right, awesome. Yeah, so chapter 18, homework. Make sure that you guys are on that. And of course, you know, let me know if you guys have any questions. I, I think I set the due date for Wednesday. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So yeah, then, uh, so. you'll also have the uh, the answer key for that by the end, uh, by, before the weekend. So our, t <clears throat> our test is next Thursday. Yes. So my goal is for next Tuesday to set aside a full day for review, give you guys a chance to do your homework on Chapter 19. Um, again, we'll we'll do a review session of chapters 18 and 19 on Tuesday, and then on Thursday we'll have an exam. I'll practice. I'll have one practice problem set up where we'll, we'll go through the motions of how we submit exams again, just because, you know, whatever, it's kind of a pain in the butt. So just to make sure that we have that all down, it's going to be the exact same as last time. I'm not going to throw any more curveballs, but again, we'll just practice it again. So we all remember. Sounds good. And uh, chapter 19 homework will be due next Tuesday. Chapter 19 homework will be due. Yeah. Monday or Tuesday. If you want till Tuesday, that's fine. Uh, bottom line is I want to do, um, I want to be done with chat, well, which will be no problem, but you will be done with chapter 19 by Thursday. You'll have the weekend to work on that homework and then get the answer key for that before the actual exam. And then well, we also have the formal this Sunday, this up and coming Sunday. I'm not going to make it due on Sunday. I was going to make it due on Tuesday because I want it done with before you guys are supposed to be studying for the exam. Mm -hmm. but yeah okay all right cool so again you have the weekend plus a tiny bit extra i don't want to it to overlap with uh the exam i want to make sure it's due a good two days before the exam so you guys have time to study for that sounds good cool all right um yeah so i i'm gonna get that uh the what's it called the um the rubric for all that, uh, do that now and post it on Canvas so you guys can see the rubric for the uh, 
formal. Again, I mean, bottom, it's going to be very similar to everything I've been asking for before. Intro, methods, conclusion, blah, blah, blah. Big focus, reaction mechanism, right? So I know it's a big pain in everybody's ass to use that fancy drawing tool here, but that's kind of the name of the game. The reaction mechanism is the most important part. So if you guys want to bang out an image early and then start working on writing the paper, that's not a bad idea. I would not put the image off until the last second. And again, just to remind everybody what I just said that I do, because I think drawing the entire reaction mechanism in those programs is kind of a pain. I think drawing the molecules in there and then like pasting it into Word or PowerPoint and doing the arrows with Word or PowerPoint are way easier than trying to do the whole thing in one of those molecular drawing programs. But y'all, y'all do whatever you want. But just FYI, that's what I do and have always done when I do uh, mechanisms. Um, so yeah. Oh, okay, so we can actually draw the the arrows and fells. You don't yeah, care about so, that. Yeah, so I mean, the arrows, you know, Word's not the greatest thing for creating images, but it's way better than those programs. Those programs are good because it's hard to draw molecules without one of those programs. But I will just draw the molecule, I'll screenshot it, paste it into a Word document, and all my arrows and stuff will come from there because then I can move them around easier. It's just, it behaves a lot better. So that's, that's what I recommend. Um, but, but again, whatever works, you all can do it. All righty. Cool. All right. All right. I will see you all on Thursday. We will finish this up and do a little bit of review, review and then more review on Tuesday. Awesome. All right. Have a good uh, rest of your day and Wednesday. Later, guys.